This ominous black box is a digital amplifier, a stereo digital amplifier. Let me show you the back of this, noting that I've already taken the lid off this and did an exploration. So we have the inputs, which is a combination. It's the jack and XLR, and these are balanced inputs. And we have an option of setting it to stereo, which is default, or parallel or bridge. When you've got it in stereo, it just treats it as two separate channels, left and right. In parallel, it only looks at one of the inputs, but puts it to both the channels. So basically speaking, you've got two channels, but it is just one uh, mono signal, so to speak. And you've got the bridge option. The bridge option uh, inverts the phase of one of the waveforms and uh, effectively means that you can connect a speaker across just the positive terminals and it drives it at twice the power. And this thing is a beefy little amplifier. It's rated about 180 watts RMS or 350 watts if it's bridged. The output is, oh, there's something else that's quite odd that they've actually put this here when this would actually, should actually belong there. Uh, it's the ground lift and that is to, basically the input signal. It lets you choose if the screen is going to be connected to the uh, chassis, the earth, the chassis, or if it's actually going to be left floating. Normally it would be uh, tied to ground, but if you've got noisy ground introducing hum and noise into your audio, you can use that lift function and just have it purely balanced, which is quite good. Uh, the output gives you the option of using speak-on connectors for a 428 ohm load or the classic pillars or banana plug type connectors here. Then we've got a little cooling fan, which uh, is quite small. It's going to be quite noisy. This is only a 1U unit, which is quite a small unit. That means it's basically one unit in a 19-inch rack. Uh, we've got the IC connector, and then we've got a voltage selector switch here that can switch between European voltage and American or other voltage basically 230 or uh, 120. On the front of the amplifier, we've got, uh, this is uh, instant, this is a pulse PLA2180D. Uh, that means two times 180 watt. Uh, we've got the gain control on the front. We've got the power indicator LED. We've got the signal present LED. It just basically flickers to show that you've got a signal there for diagnostic purposes. And then we get the clip LED, which means the amplifier is close to its maximum output and it's potentially going to damage the speakers or damage that amplifier. But well, it should protect. It should over protect against overheating and stuff. The main thing is with clipping, you don't want to go there. You, a brief pulse every so often if you're really pushing it hard is okay, but not continuous because that puts a lot of strain. The speakers run them DC. They stop being uh, uh, impedance and become a resistance. Uh, we've got the ventilation grills here, very slick, uh, to allow the air from that fan to go somewhere. And then we've got a power on-off switch. There is a bit of foam behind these ventilation grills. I think it's basically to stop bugs getting in or something like that. I'm not really sure because uh, there's not much uh, space for the air to get in here, is there? Quite odd. Anyway, I've already had this open, so I only put one screw in it to save time. So I shall whip that screw out now. I shall open it up and then refocus on the interior. Here is the interior. Look how minimalist that is, right? Tell you what, we'll focus down there, super sharp. Let me walk, actually, you know what? The pictures are almost, I'll give you a brief thing, but I've got some pictures printing off and then I'll show you in the pictures. But the basic thing is we've got the power supply board, a ribbon cable taking power across. We've got the amplifier board, a very interesting way of clamping the transistors down here. We've got the uh, speaker board and then we've got this uh, little board here, which is the incoming signal which is all just covered in op amps, low noise op amps uh, that deals with the balanced signals and basically processing it for feeding over to the amplifier. Uh, right, tell you what, I'm going to go and grab those pictures now and then we'll explore it in greater detail. One moment please. And explore. Okay, I kind of went a bit far than I was expecting but this is good. So let's take a look at the amplifier uh, well, the power supply for the amplifier section first. So I have taken a picture of it such that we can zoom in it easier and I can point at bits and write numbers and things. The incoming supply goes via this big metal oxide varistor down here. And there is some filtering circuitry and the bridge rectifier and then super duper big death beam capacitors. There's two because it's using that thing whereby if we take a look at the voltage selector switch, we've got a couple of wires going to it, it can bridge out part of the bridge effectively and uh, ultimately 
uh, do a push-pull thing for 120 volts that it charges both capacitors up to get a decent voltage inside. So um, with 230 to 240 volts, uh, it charges up to say 330 volts, but with the 120 volts, it'll also charge up to that. We have a com mode suppression choke. We have class Y capacitors, which I'd expect to be going down to the local ground pin. Uh, and then rather oddly down here, we have a IR2156, which is an electronic ballast controller. For lamps, but they've used it as a push pull driver for the transformer in this. That's odd. I guess, and they've just chosen it as a cheap mass produced chip that's really rugged. So it is using these two uh, 26NM60N by ST uh, MOSFETs to actually push pull this transformer by the look of it. These things that I originally thought, I thought this was a, just a bank of diodes. It's not. These are the diodes. There's a, a MUR 1620 CA and a CT. One of them has the diodes pointing in the way. One of them has it pointing out the way. They're the main rectification because this is a sort of dual rail system. And it's also, he got here, a 7812 for a positive 12 volt rail and a 7912 for a negative uh, uh, supply rail. Other things on this circuit board, it's got the outlet to the fan um, and it's also got a temperature sensor that is going from here onto the uh, heat sink plate for the amplifier. So presumably if that gets too hot, it's signaling back. Now there is a ribbon cable going from uh, this section to the amplifier board. That's not just carrying power, it's carrying signals. But these pins are clustered as sets of six. We've got the plus supply on six, the main supply on six, the ground on six, and then we've got the six controls and signal pins for basically indicating when this is powered up and stabilized and te over temperature and loads of other things. Uh, the amplifier board itself, oh, it's worth mentioning. Look here and here, there's something I don't actually like that much, and it's the soldering at the back of these uh, pillars for connecting the speakers. They've soldered that side relatively, but this side's fairly dry. If you have a problem with any of these amplifiers and it's crackling when you wiggle those connections, check these solder joints. The other option is to switch over to the speak-ons. Uh, the input board has a fair amount of circuitry on it. I'm not going to reverse engineer that. There's tons. That's a very big schematic. Uh, and it uh, deals with uh, processing that analog signal. I'm not sure where this switching, I think that happens on the actual amplifier board, but that also has the volume control board and also the indication of like clipping and stuff like that going over here. The board that I have removed from here, the reason I've removed it was to see how they've mounted the transistors. So they've got these transistors is folded flat on the back and uh, they have a plate that goes through here and the Transistors are physically pressed onto that heat sink by the plate. Now, let me show you it. This is it. It's a metal plate with four screws through it. And a little plastic spacer covers. It's actually the spacer longer than the screws, but it basically goes through and it's the bit that pushes the transistor. And then they tighten a single screw in the middle down and they've tightened it really tight to the point the plate is deformed slightly just to actually make sure all those transistors are pressed firmly into contact with this uh, insulating pad on the heat sink. That's very good. Um, if we take a look at this circuit board, we have... What's the best way to put this? There's the speaker output connections. That relay is the anti-thump relay. It's designed to only come in once the circuitry is stabilised. And it's uh, between the inductors. These inductors and capacitor networks are the filters on the output of the amplifier. Uh, just to reduce, remove this sort of high frequency switching noise. We've got local decoupling capacitors or smoothing capacitors just local to the amplifier. Uh, two for the plus rail and two for the negative rail. Uh, there's the ribbon cable coming on. We've got this massive array, effectively a programmable array of resistors, somehow tied into the 41C. I think that's to do with either sensing or a power supply, but it's kind of hard working out what it's doing. Um, it looks as though it may be for a local power supply, particularly given these Zener diodes. It seems to be detecting a threshold in some way. That's a standard NPN transistor. We have LM3, I think it's LM319. Hold on, let me just double check that. There's two chips on here I couldn't identify. That's quite annoying. Uh, 
LM319M, we've got two of those, which are uh, comparators, I think, which are pro possibly dealing with the uh, analogue to uh, digital output. And then we get these two chips here, which uh, I'll try and read it. It's very, very small text. Mega. Mega something. Hold on. Mega Semi. Uh, that did not come up with them. It came up with an AliExpress seller, but not thing. And their number is ME98-1036. Under that is what looks like a date code E2106. I drew a blank on that. I did not find those chips. But I do get the feeling that they are driving those transistors on the other side, so in the sort of H-bridge type format. Well, not the H-bridge, ultimately. They're just push-pull either side. But it is effectively kind of an H... Well, it is when it's in, uh, in a particular mode in the amplifier when it's doing this abridged. Uh, but there we go. Is there anything else worth saying about this? We have the beefy power supply. We've got the fan only blowing across that power supply. It's really just what they're doing with this fan is they're basically just stirring air in this box. Um, and that's more or less it. Signal processing, output, the amplifier section with this slab of metal here, not <coughs> finned heat sinks. Uh, this chunk of uh, aluminium here for the uh, uh, switch mode power supply with the diodes and output and the MOSFETs and input and some voltage regulation filtering, the voltage selection, the transformer for isolation, and then just power and signals going across. That is it. So it's quite neat. Quite a neat amplifier indeed. Uh, I am already zoomed out. Okay, right. Uh, but there we go. That is the Pulse PLA... What is it again? PLA2180D which is rated 180 watts RMS per channel. It's pretty good, isn't it, for something that's so minimalist inside. But that's the magic of digital amplifiers. They are fantastic things. They make life a lot easier in the entertainment industry because they just uh, make things lighter. Oh, there is one thing worth mentioning. They've put a nice smear of silicone up the bus bar on the uh, positive connect, the live connection, to say, down to the fuse. That's quite a nice feature. And it is Earth, which is also a nice feature. And that Earth is snug. This is good. But there we go. The Pulse Digital Amplifier. Very minimalist, very functional.